Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Sri and the CTS for inviting me to speak on this topic. Yet again, this is the third time I think I've been invited very kindly to speak on this topic. I'm just sitting there and listening to Mike and all of you in the discussions earlier. And uh, the first time that I spoke at this meeting on this topic, I was challenged by uh, one of your colleague thoracic surgeons saying it doesn't make physiological sense. And a few years down the line, I can see that many thoracic surgeons are actually placing the valves and doing all the bronchoscopic interventions so clearly probably make some physiological sense. And probably in the years to come, you won't need an intervention of pulmonologist or a chest physician to come and speak on this topic. All of you seem to be uh, really keen on it. Um, my job, uh, I was told, is to convince you that uh, you may not need surgery in due course for uh, emphysema because of endobronchial therapies. And it looks like most of you are already convinced uh, that job is made easier. And secondly, Mike has given a very uh, thorough introduction, so I'll skip through some of the slides that I have uh, prepared. I don't have any commercial interest, uh, although I've been involved in them, some studies of the valves, early studies of the valves. Um, Mike has already covered uh, the pros and cons of surgery uh, to some extent and mentioned the NET trial. I just want to highlight one point that even in the NET trial, the exercise capacity improvement and the quality of life improvement compared to the control arm uh, was not massive, and it was restricted to this group of patients with upper lobe and low exercise tolerance. So much so, the couple of uh, articles written by surgeons highlighted that the death rate of surgery is about, uh, oh, sorry, this keeps moving. Death rate of surgery is about uh, 6 to 10 percent nationwide, and it is one of the highest risk procedures um, in practice. Um, so, and also, they mentioned that the 90-day mortality was 4%. In-hospital stay was 13.5 days. Persistent air leak was the main contributor to the in-hospital stay. I don't know whether you see this in your practice now. Um, pneumonia, etc. All this led to the birth of uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And this is the first paper from the Brompton Tudor Termine Group. And in N equals 8 study made it into the Lancet, um, which was groundbreaking. And of the eight patients who were taken up for this valve placement, five of them were thought not to be uh, you know, fit for surgery or for anesthesia, and three um, actually refused to undergo the operation. But by default, this led to a number of studies in the use of valves and other techniques which I'm going to cover over the next few minutes. I've divided the techniques into two, um, reversible techniques and the other bit is bronchoscopic treatment of lung parenchyma. So let's cover these in the next few minutes. First of all, the reversible techniques, the most commonly used valve is uh, what you see up here. This is the Zephyr valve, which is a one-way valve, which is what uh, all of you. Uh, in fact, how many of you are placing valves, thoracic surgeons, by the way? Fair number. Um, this is a, a pretty straightforward procedure. Uh, that's why we physicians do them, besides surgeons. Um, and, and it involves some assessment, which I'll go through in a minute, through the flexible bronchoscope. Most of our procedures are done under sedation, although I, I tend to do it in a deep sedation list with an anesthetist, giving propofol, uh, but can be done under, even under moderate sedation. The first major trial that was carried out, and there are a number of trials since, the first major trial was a VENT trial. There's a US VENT trial and a, and a Euro VENT trial. It showed that there was some modest improvement in these patients with emphysema with regard to dyspnea and quality of life and with regard to six minute walk test and some improvement in lung function. But the adverse events that were mentioned were pneumonia and hemoptysis and pneumothorax. I mentioned this uh, here because in the years that followed and the studies that followed, pneumothorax incidents progressively uh, went up. And why is that? Because we got better and better at achieving target lung volume reduction. It became evident that you can do uh, a great deal of good for these patients only if you achieve proper loba atelectasis. And how do we do this? This is uh, what uh, Mike has uh, outlined very nicely. Uh, in, the, in, in the MDT, we discuss how uh, and uh, likely that we are going to achieve target lung volume reduction. This is by the use of CT planning 
to ensure that the fissure is intact, to exclude other potential reasons for turning down the patient. And then during bronchoscopy, we do a chartus assessment, a specific uh, balloon catheter is passed through the bronchoscope. Using this console, we then view the flow, the expiratory flow, which is seen here. Oops. Um, the expiratory flow and the inspiratory pressure and the airway resistance, and that tells us whether there is collateral ventilation or not. Daniel Gompelman's study from uh, Heidelberg showed that using the charter study alone, you are likely to be uh, right 75% of the time. But if you combine with HRCT planning and better um, imaging that is used now, which is something like this, this is called the VEDA scanning, or more recently, a web-based Stratex platform where you upload the CT scan and then it generates data, including the presence or absence of an intact fissure and predicts the likelihood of collateral ventilation or absence of it. With all these techniques, a number of studies have been done in the last few years. Mike mentioned about the NICE uh, review and NICE guidelines from 2013. Since then, there have been a few extremely well-designed studies. This one from the Brompton, the Believer Hi-Fi study, which is a double-blind sham control RCT, which demonstrated that there is safety and efficacy of endobronchial valves in patients selected purely with HRCT. So that was a Believer Hi-Fi study. Then you had the study, which is the Stelvio study, which used, it's an RCT again. This is from the Netherlands, Dirk Jan Slebos's group, showing that if you use um, the charters alone, you can potentially improve the likelihood of uh, achieving target loba atelectasis, volume reduction in atelectasis. Most recently, Arshang Walipur and team from um, uh, Austria have done an excellent study called the IMPACT study, but this was unique in that this picked up even homogenous emphysema. You touched upon, you asked about homogenous emphysema, and using CT and using chartist to select patients even within the homogenous emphysema group, which is a large group, make sure that 28% in your study were homogenous and therefore you could not do the uh, you know, lung volume reduction. This IMPACT study, I don't have time to go through in detail, but this uh, clearly uh, puts us in a different path uh, with regard to the use of valves. Trying to summarize all these studies in one slide, you will see that majority of these studies have shown, uh, uh, these studies certainly have shown that there is an improvement in lung function, improvement in six-minute walk test, and a dramatic improvement in St. George's respiratory questionnaire. The quality of life improvement is uh, quite marked. So these days when we talk about uh, talk to patients when they come to the emphysema clinic for assessment, we present all this data, this up-to-date data, and discuss with them the benefits versus risks. No doubt many of these patients come and tell me that, um, that they've watched something on one show, um, and therefore they want to undergo a coil procedure as opposed to valves. They bring the Daily Mail articles, the cutouts, and say this shows that valves are better, so I prefer valves, uh, but we, from our side, we try to present all this literature. There is one other valve which is not used extensively uh, in the UK, but in Europe, certainly, it is used, and this is the spiration valve. This is a study that I was involved uh, about 10 years ago, um, and this valve, uh, spiration valve, is a very uh, effective valve, which has been uh, marketed by Olympus now, um, but they do not uh, make a device for collateral ventilation assessment. They're looking at more about CT selection for these patients. The European study which, was, uh, which we were involved with was a sham control study, and again it showed some improvement in uh, CT changes and in SGRQ, but there was no lung function response. So that's about reversible techniques. In the next few minutes, I'm going to cover irreversible techniques or treatment of lung parenchyma. One of the early studies which was done was with heated water vapor. Even hot water has been used, but this was heated water vapor, and it did seem to produce quite marked inflammation, occlusion, and atelectasis. The only downside was that these patients developed severe pneumonia and very severe exacerbations, 
And uh, in fact, there were a couple of uh, mortality uh, incidents uh, immediately after the procedure, and therefore this technique was suspended temporarily, but it's being studied again in a more selective uh, patient subgroup um, in a more controlled fashion. The similar story was, uh, was what panned out with the biological lung volume reduction using Aeroseal, a hydrogen fibrin, fibrin thrombin mixture. And uh, there again, there was very good improvement of uh, lung function, but extremely severe side effects with uh, pneumonias and infective exacerbations. And that uh, warrants further study, and I know I'm aware of some studies that are taking place. What has uh, uh, come um, more recently, but is slightly more evidence-based, is the use of coils. How many of you have been involved with the placement of coils? It's one, two, three. Okay. So uh, surgeons have entered the uh, coil arena as well, which is great to see. Um, this, the principle with the coils is that it simply improves elastic recoil, thereby restoring the radial suspension of the airways, reducing airway resistance, reducing air trapping, and thus improving exercise performance in dyspnea. That's the, that's the principle, that's the hypothesis. And um, these coils uh, need to be placed under fluoroscopy guidance. Um, this is uh, a procedure being performed uh, real time. Um, this uh, video shows that it's being done through the rigid bronchoscope and through that the flexible bronchoscope. In our center, we do it under general anesthesia with an ET tube, 8.5 ET tube in place and uh, under fluoroscopy guidance. This is an expensive procedure because each coil costs uh, on paper about uh, 1,000 pounds. And you end up placing, last week, uh, placed some coils in a patient, and it, it ended up with 13 coils in the uh, left lower lobe. Um, so it's quite expensive, uh, but we are doing it as a part of a European registry, uh, research registry. The first randomized trial which was done was from the Brompton. Uh, Pallav Shah's group randomized uh, patients to coils or best supportive care, and they sh uh, showed that there was an improvement in SGRQ and in uh, six-minute walking distance, and that seemed to suggest uh, that uh, the coils are uh, effective as well as safe. A larger, more recent study, two studies actually have been published. I'll mention one of them, the RENEW study uh, in, in JAMA. Uh, it's a multi-center study. Majority of the centers were in the US and five in Europe. And uh, this study the, with the coils has given us some further information about the efficacy of coils, relative safety of coils, but the most important bit of information that we've gained from this study is that the higher the residual volume, and in some of the algorithms they've used, a net trial used residual volume greater than 150%. We went up to 175% in the next study, greater than 200%, and in this, the subgroup analysis shows that if the residual volume is greater than 225%, those patients did better. And this study included both heterogeneous and homogeneous emphysema. In our algorithm at, uh, in our, at, uh, at Preston, we use uh, residual volume greater than 200%. So based on all this information, Pallav and uh, Felix from Heidelberg um, wrote a very nice article in Thorax trying to suggest an algorithm which has been modified subsequently, but gives you an idea of where things are evolving in this field. FEV1 less than 45%, residual volume greater than 200%, optimal medical treatment, including pulmonary rehabilitation, HRCT, V put in, quantitative perfusion scan on top of that. We also do an echocardiogram and uh, then have a discussion in the MDT, which is then divided into heterogeneous or homogeneous, Depending upon the tissue destruction, we always ask the surgeons first because we prefer, as it stands, as Mike mentioned in the goal guidelines also, we prefer to explore the surgical approach first. Otherwise, we think about valves or coils, and then comes the collateral ventilation assessment. What I'm trying to say is any procedure for emphysema should be performed only with a systematic evaluation in an MDT setting, with the thoracic surgeon being present, exploring also the possibility of entering these patients into research trials. So in conclusion, interventional pulmonology, as I put it, I know it's thoracic surgical interventional pulmonology as well, in emphysema is exciting, it's evolving, it's no doubt expensive, 
Evidence base for endobronchial therapy is emphysema is growing. In the last three years, there have been four major randomized controlled trials. Systematic assessment is crucial. The valves and coils seem promising, but preferably as it stands should be done in larger volume centers, considering research, or at least a registry and very clear audit and governance protocols. Emphysema MDT introduction has led to not an increase in the number of interventional pulmonology procedures. What we have seen is an increase in LVRS, which is for the benefit of the patient. There has been a very good cost analysis done in the Revelance trial, which was published from France recently. I've not had a chance to go through, which shows that these techniques are indeed extremely expensive. Complications should not be underestimated because with the valves, initially we saw about 5% incidence of pneumothorax. With better technique and better patient selection, that incidence has gone up to over 20% pneumothorax in many centers. And I think surgical and bronchoscopic techniques are complementary. That's why we believe in a full-fledged multi-professional effort. And I always show my surgical colleagues, one of them who's there, that we need their help as well sometimes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.